I'm really delighted to introduce Edith Elkin, uh, who is a professor at Oxford University. Uh, she's been uh, doing some of the foundational work uh, for uh, several decades in computational social choice, uh, working on problems in voting uh, and fair division. Uh, and uh, she's been one of the uh, uh, members of the EC community for her entire career. Uh, early work uh, in uh, doing some foundational stuff, opening up new areas in algorithmic mechanism design. Uh, uh, she wrote the first paper on frugality uh, in mechanism design, uh, studying path auctions in 2004. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, a paper that, uh, in hindsight, uh, was one of the first papers on sample complexity in mechanism design. Her paper, Designing and Learning Optimal Finite Support Auctions in 2007, uh, which uh, one of the, you know, well before its time uh, papers in this area. Uh, and she's also been, um, you know, doing awesome service for the field. She was the uh, EC program chair in 2018. Uh, she's the HKI uh, program chair this year to, uh, in uh, 23. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know HKI, it's uh, the, one of the top machine learning conferences. And, uh, and so, you know, hundreds of millions of papers submitted and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, so far harder than, uh, than our job in EC. Um, and so uh, with that, let's welcome Edith Elkin. Thanks, Jason, for the kind introduction. It's amazing to be introduced by someone who knows what I did in 2004. <laughs> it doesn't happen in the AI community. Okay, anyway. So this is work about multi-winner voting, more narrowly, multi-winner voting with approval ballots, even more narrowly fairness, even more narrowly proportionality in that setting. Okay, so let me start with a warm-up example. So suppose you're organizing a smallish workshop, right? So your workshop has just nine PC members, six of them work in algorithms, three work in game theory, so it's an algorithmic game theory workshop, right? And you're, it's a three-day workshop, so you want to select one invited speaker for each day. Right, and being a you know, democratically minded PC chair, you ask your PC members which invited speaker they would want to see. And you've got five invited speaker candidates, and you've got nine PC members, right, and these are the approval votes. Right, so the way to read it is the first column is the first PC member, the first PC member says, I want to see speakers one, two, and three. I'm not particularly interested in what the other two speakers have to say. Right, and you, as you can see, the speakers you can't really classify the speakers as algorithms or game theory because they have a bit of mixed appeal, but broadly, some are more game theory and some are more algorithm speakers. Okay, so if you have these votes, so, my, so I would say, yes, the last two speakers are game theory speakers. So the question I want to ask, should there be a game theory speaker at this workshop? Right? Okay, so think about it for a moment. Imagine really you are a workshop organizer, so what would be your answer? Right, and different people can answer this question differently. So I don't think it's obvious either way, but what I'm going to do throughout this talk, I want to make an argument that there should be a game theory speaker and we want to have decision procedures that ensure that there's a game theory speaker in this setting. Okay, so what's the formal setup? The formal setup is very simple. We'll be talking about voting with approval ballots. In the previous slides, voters approved or disapproved candidates, and this is what we're going to stick with. So we have a finite set of candidates, alternatives. We have a finite set of voters, and voters have approval ballots. Right, so each voter approves a subset of candidates. And the goal is to select K winners. So this problem is already interesting for K equals one, but throughout this talk, we'll be mostly talking about the cases when K is greater than one. And know that in the previous slide, K was three, we wanted to select three speakers. So it will be convenient to illustrate it visually uh, as follows. So we'll have a picture where we'll illustrate it by saying that voters are dots and candidates are circles or ellipses covering the, these dots, right? And the intuition is that in this setting, you want to cover voters by candidates, right? So you want to select a set of candidates that nicely covers all the voters, right? So set cover intuition will be useful throughout the talk. Okay, so if you have approval ballots, what's the easiest thing you can do? Well, you have approval ballots, you can count approvals, right? You can, and this is known as approval voting. In approval voting, each candidate gets one point from each voter who approves her. 
Right, so you may worry, and then we select K guys with the largest number of approvals. You may worry about toys, let's not worry about toys. Let's say we, may, we break them deterministically. Right, so for instance, in this setting, right, and this is just to kind of explain how we use this illustrative model. We have five voters who approve C1, C2, C3. We have four voters who approve C4, right? And suppose we want to select three candidates. So then approval voting will count approvals and select C1, C2, C3. Right, and you can see how this is perhaps not an ideal solution because the group on the left, the group of voters on the left is nearly as large as the group of voters on the right. So you think if you select three candidates, we could you know, try and do something for the voters on the right. But approval voting does not do that at all. Right, and if you go back to our workshop example, you, may also, you will also notice that approval voting will not give us a game theory speaker. Okay, so if you didn't find these two little examples convincing, okay, so let me try to kind of make that argument again, perhaps more convincingly. Here we have five voters who get three representatives, four voters who get zero representatives. Right, so scale it up to, you know, one million and nine, uh, nine, 99, one, one million and just under one million, right? So one group is on the left, the other group is on the right. So what approval voting would do, it would just select uh, the candidates approved by the voters on the left, right? And the reason why this is unfair is that intuitively if you have K slots, then perhaps each group of size N over K deserves a representative, right? So K slots, N people, right? Each group of size N over K deserves something. Okay, so now in what sense does a group of size n over k deserve anything at all? Right, if this group has very diverse preferences, so there's no way to make that group happy, right? Arguably, they're not even a group, right? So they're just random n over k people, right? So for a group to deserve something, I, I, I would like to argue that this group should be at least somewhat cohesive, have some agreement, right? And the simplest way to define cohesive is to say that we want to guarantee something to groups of voters that exhibit agreement. For instance, agree on a specific candidate, right? And this is something that we'll try to formalize. Okay, so now let me try to tell you the story of the notions that appear in this line of work and how they came to be. So for me, the story starts in 2014 when I attended the IIII conference in Quebec City where at the MPEF workshop, not at the conference proper, at the MPEF workshop, Harry Sazes and Toby Walsh had a paper that they called, I think, justified representation. Or well, anyway, that was the main notion introduced in that paper. Right? And the definition of justified representation, it was in this model, and the, their definition went as, went as follows. We say that the committee, a set of candidates of size K, provides justified representation for a given input, which is a list of ballots of all voters, and given committee size K, if the following bad situation doesn't happen. There's a large cohesive set of voters that goes completely unrepresented. Okay, so let me kind of say, say that in math now. So large means size at least n over k, because we argue that a group of size n over k deserves representation. Cohesive means that they agree on a candidate, so the intersection of their ballots is non-empty, right? And completely unrepresented would be that the set of, that the set of, uh, that the selected committee contains no candidates from the union of their ballots. Right, so that's the bad situation, right? So there's a large cohesive set of voters that is unrepresented, right? And we see that the committee W satisfies justified representation if this situation is avoided, right? If there is no such large cohesive set of voters that is unrepresented. Okay, so that was their definition, right? And kind of immediate observation is, of course, that approval voting fails justified representation, right? And kind of our running example can be used to see that because here the group on the right is definitely a large cohesive group. So here, let's say k equals three. So a group of size three deserves a representative, nine over three, right? So the group on the right is bigger. It has four voters. They're, it's cohesive. It agrees on C4, right? So they deserve a representative and under approval voting, they will remain completely unrepresented. So approval voting fails to Okay, so why do we care about something like that? Right, presume, okay, so I, I gave you a motivating example of workshop uh, invited speaker selection, but this is probably not the most important application, right? So where else would we care for something like that? Well, certainly representative governing bodies, right? So the bodies where we want to hear from different groups of stakeholders, th think something like that university council, not necessarily, you know, country p parliament that makes decisions, but the body that represents kind of all the stakeholders we want to have all voices heard, right? So advertising here, I'm thinking about which products to put on a supermarket flyer that goes out at the end of the week, right? And you want to appeal to different groups of shoppers. 
right? Search engines, right? So this is stretching it slightly, but what I'm thinking about here is, say you have a search, say the user enters search word Jaguar, and you don't know if they're searching for the animal, the car, or I've been told there's a sports team, Jaguar. Right, so you want all three of those represented on the top page in some proportion. Right, and this is again this sort of ideas. Right, and in block, and I've been told that in blockchain proof of stake, kind of these notions are apparently useful as well, right, because when you choose verifiers for the next block of transactions, you want to have different groups of <coughs> stakeholders in your blockchain represented. Right, and apparently there is a blockchain called Polkadot that uses some of these ideas and some of the voting rules I'm going to talk about in their selection algorithms. Okay, so we want to have justified representation. Approval voting doesn't give us justified representation. What can we try? So here's a simple algorithm that I'm going to argue in one slide gives you justified representation. Right, and it's the greedy algorithm. So think of it as greedy set coverage. At each point, we proceed in K steps. We want to select K candidates. At each point, we select a candidate that covers as many uncovered voters as possible. Okay, and the claim is that this approach guarantees justified representation. Why is that? Well, it's very easy to see. Right? So at each point, so suppose for the sake of contradiction that after K steps, we have this large cohesive unhappy group of voters, right? So they're cohesive, so there's some candidate whom they approve, C, and who is not selected, and they all remain completely unrepresented. Right, so then of course, at each point, we could have chosen that C, right, and by choosing that C, we would have covered N over K unrepresented voters. We never chose C, right, and we were greedy. So at each point, we were choosing someone who was at least as good as C, meaning at each point, we covered at least N over K candidates. We, we had K steps like that, so by now, we should have represented everyone contradiction. Right, so very easy argument. Okay, so with the greedy, we can have justified representation. Right. In fact, for good measure, let me give you another voting rule. Right. And this argument was in the original MPEF paper. So what, was it, what intrigued Harris and Toby in the MPEF paper was the following voting rule, proportional approval voting. Right. And it was an open problem in their workshop paper whether that satisfies justified representation. So the way this voting rule goes is as follows. It was proposed by Thiele, a Danish polymath in the early 20th century. It was proposed, in fact, with the idea of actually selecting the Danish parliament governing bodies. Right? And the, the definition of this rule is as follows. So suppose you're a voter, right, and you're looking at a committee to be selected. Of course, you're very unhappy if you're not represented at all. So say from your first representative, if you just have one, one person you approve on the committee, let's normalize it, say that you have utility of one from having one representative. Okay, one representative is really important, so that's one. Having a second representative would be good, right? But maybe not as important as having the first representative. So say if you have a second representative of the committee, the marginal utility of that to you would be one half. So from having two representatives, you have, you have utility one plus one half. So what about the third one? Again, nice to have, but not necessary. So let's say one third. So from having three representatives, you get one, one half, one plus one half plus one third and et cetera, following harmonic series, right? And this is exactly what Thiele proposed, right? And then the goal is to select the size K committee that maximizes the sum of voters' utilities, right? And of course, the caveat here, I told you how voters evaluate the given committee. I didn't quite tell you how to select a committee, right? So algorithmically, I gave you a method for evaluating committees. I didn't give you a method for selecting committees. Okay, so just to illustrate how this is different from approval voting, well, under approval voting, if we were to select two candidates here, we would, of course, select C1 and C2, because each of them has approval score 5, right? And the guy on the right, C3, has approval score 4, right? But what, ha what happens under PAV? Under PAV, if you were to select C1 and C2, each of the voters on the left would have utility 1 plus 1 half from selecting two people they approve, right? So you get 5 times 1.5, that's 7.5. Right? Whereas if you were to select C1 and C3, you'll get utility 1 for voters on the left and utility of 1 for voters on the right, so you get 9. Right? So in this setting, PAV would represent all the voters. Right? So you can see why this might be a good voting rule if the, rule, if the goal is to represent more voters, if the goal is to achieve some kind of proportionality. Right? But that was an open question by asked in Toby Stork at MPREF, right? and it was an intriguing open question. Okay, I'm looking at Vince here. Vince, I think, wasn't there himself, but there were two members of his research group, Rupert Freeman and Marcus Burley in the talk. Right, and I think, I don't see Marcus here, but... Okay, so. oh, over there, over there. 
Right. And I think, yeah, so Marcus can probably confirm. So Marcus and Rupert were really intrigued by the problem. I was really intrigued by the problem. And we started working on it, right? So the open question left by the talk was whether PAV satisfies JR. And I think within a few days, both research groups sent email to Harry saying, hey, we found a proof. OK, and it wasn't a particularly complicated proof. Let me actually give you a, a sketch of the proof. OK, so the basic idea is as follows. So suppose you have this committee that fails JR, right? So this means that there's some candidate that is approved by a large cohesive group who is not in the committee. Right? And if you were to add that candidate to the committee, if somehow magically you could create one more slot in the committee, right? so that would give utility of one to at least an over k voters, PAV utility, right? because they will go from zero representatives to one. Right? So that would increase the PAV utility by at least an over k. Right? So now the challenge is to prove that someone in the committee, currently in the committee, can be removed. Right? And by removing that person from the committee, you would lose less than an over k. Right? So someone in the committee currently is not being sufficiently useful. Okay, right, and therefore, of course, we could swap the guy in the committee with that guy outside of the committee who is liked by the large cohesive group and thereby increase the PAV score. Okay, so the meat of the proof now is how to prove that the committee that fails justified representation contains this slacker candidate. Okay, and that argument is also fairly simple, so let me actually give you the argument. Okay, so when I talked about marginal contribution, right, I didn't define it formally, so let me do it now. So what is a marginal contribution of a candidate towards voter I? Right, so that's the difference between, so I'm looking at the candidate currently in the committee, and I'm comparing two quantities. The utility of voter I for the current committee, and the utility of voter I for the committee without that guy. Right, and I call that the marginal contribution of that candidate A to voter I. Right, and I can sum it over all voters, right, and this way I get marginal contribution of a candidate in the committee. Okay. So, marginal contribution of a candidate is exactly by how much the utility of voters would go down if I were to kick that candidate out of the committee. Right, so now my goal is to prove that the marginal contribution of some candidate is less than an over key. Okay, let's look at a picture. So here I have four voters. Voter one approves four members of the committee. Voter two approves three members of the committee. Voter three approves five. Voter four approves three. Three of them approve A, the last one doesn't. So what is the marginal contribution of A to voter one? Voter 1's current utility is 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fourth. And without A, we wouldn't have this last 1 fourth component. Right, so the marginal contribution of A to voter 1 is 1 fourth. Right, and his contribution to voter 2 is 1 third, and to voter 3 is 1 fifth, and to voter 4 is 0, because voter 4 actually doesn't approve voter candidate A. Right, so therefore marginal contribution of A can be counted like that. Right, and perhaps something to note is that I said marginal contribution of A is one fourth, but so would be the marginal contribution of any other candidate approved by voter one, right? Because if you just remove one of the candidates I approve from the committee, I have one less, so there was K of them, the last one contributed one over K, okay, K is the committee size, so I should use a different letter. There was L of them, I, so my, so the last of them contributed one over L, so I lose one over L when he or she is kicked out. Right, and what that also means is that the sum of marginal contributions of different members of the committee to my utility is exactly one. Right, so here A contributes one fourth and the other three guys also contribute one fourth. So it sums up to one. Right, and this is, if you may notice that this is a feature of specifically PAV rule, that these numbers sum up to one. Okay, so what do I want to do now? I want to argue that the sum of marginal contributions of candidates in the committee is less than n. Right, so let me write this quantity, sum of marginal contributions. Let me write it out. Let me swap the order of summation. So here it goes. Right, and now what am I looking at? Look at the inner sum. So I'm looking at the vote, I fix I. I look at the sum of marginal contributions of different committee members to the utility of voter I. Right, and as I argued here, this is one, right? So it's one fourth from A and one fourth from three other guys, right? Unless my voter doesn't approve anyone in the committee. Right, and in fact, I know that since my committee fails justified representation, there are voters whose utility from the committee is zero. In fact, I have at least an over k such voters. Right, so I have, uh, so, I, so this quantity is exactly the number of voters who approve some committee members, and it's less than n. Right, so all I need, in fact, is that it's strictly less than n, but in fact, it's, I can also say that it's less than equal n minus n over k. Right, because n over k is the number of voters have zero representatives. Right, and therefore, dividing through by k, right, by averaging argument, there is some candidate whose marginal contribution is less than an over key. Right, so theorem proof. Proportional approval voting satisfies justified representation. 
Okay, does it seem like a good place to finish the talk? Okay, so I gave you two voting crews. So I formulate an axiom. I gave you two voting crews that satisfy the axiom. Okay, why are we not done? Okay, have we solved the issue of fair representation? Right, two, perhaps two questions to ask ourselves. Is justified representation, is, is justified representation really the right axiom to capture the notion of proportionality? Or maybe we want something stronger? Right, that's one question, axiomatic. Right, so varying my social choice theories, right? right? And now, actually remembering that I'm a computer scientist, right, algorithmically, right? So do these provide satisfactory solutions? Okay, so let's start with axiomatic angle, right? So asking is, if justified representation is enough. So let me blow up the example we had before. Okay, so I was lazy and I only drew 13 voters on the left, but imagine it's not 13, it's 13 million, right? And it's two on the right, right? And my job is to select two candidates. Should I really? Okay, so what does justified representation tell me? Justified representation tells me that I should choose one of C1, C2, C3. Right, and it doesn't tell me anything about C4 one way or that. But perhaps if really I have 13 million here and two there, maybe really I should be selecting two candidates on the left, right? Two candidates liked by the 13 million. Right, because that's maybe more fair in proportion. Right, so broadly, maybe if I have very large, very coherent group of voters, maybe it deserves not just one representative, but many. Right, and there's a natural way of scaling up the justified representation axiom, right, and this is as follows. If N over K voters who agree on a candidate deserve one representative, if I have L times as many voters who agree on L candidates, right, so then maybe they deserve L representatives. Right, so that's just a very natural way of scaling up the justified representation axiom. So we called it, so that was in the same paper, right? So what happened after Marcus and Marcus Rupert and Vince and I wrote to Harris and Toby, they graciously invited us to write a joint paper, which we wrote for AAAI, right? And in that paper, we also proposed this idea of extended justified representation, right? So the way this action goes is as follows, right? So we say that the committee provides extended justified representation if we avoid a slightly broader range of bad situations. Right, so now bad situations we want to avoid is as follows. There is an L large, L cohesive group, right, and no member of that group gets L representatives. L large means has size at least L times N over K. L cohesive means agrees on L candidates, right, and we want at least one voter in that group to get L representatives. And of course for L equals one it collapses to justified representation. Right, so this is obviously a more demanding axiom. So the question is, okay, so we now have two voting crews that actually satisfies JR. Do they also satisfy each other? Well, the first voting crew to look at would be greedy approval voting, and it's really easy to see that it fails the extended justified representation axiom. Why? Well, I could give you a specific counterexample, but just intuitively, greedy approval voting is about covering voters. Right, once a voter is covered once, greedy approval voting no longer cares about it. Right, so, it's not in the business of giving voters many representatives. So inevitably it will fail to do so even when this is demanded by extended justified representation. In contrast, proportional approval voting actually satisfies extended justified representation. And the argument for that is not very different from the argument I gave you. It's also a local swap argument. It also says there's a guy outside who could give us lots of additional PAV utility, right? And if the axiom is violated, there's a guy inside who isn't giving us an awful lot of utility. So we could swap those and we could do better with regards to PAV score. Okay, so axiomatically, we've narrowed it down from two, vo from two voting crews to one. So initially we had greedy approval voting and proportional approval voting, right? And now we discarded greedy approval voting because it doesn't satisfy the strong action. So we are left with proportional approval voting. Right, so now let's look at it computationally. So when I was talking about proportional approval voting, I told you how to evaluate the committee. I didn't tell you how to find a good committee. And of course you can find a good committee by going through all possible committees, evaluating their PAV score and selecting the best one. But that's computationally expensive. And in fact, it's, not, there's a, it's been shown around the same time that proportional approval voting is in fact and be hard to evaluate. Right? So if you want efficient computability, uh, then proportional approval voting is perhaps not a great voting group. Right, so the challenge, and this is how we ended that paper, so that was a paper from AAAI 15, is, is there an easy to compute voting rule that actually satisfies the EJR action? Right, and this is where we left it off in 2015. So there was a journal version a couple of years later, but kind of the history is, okay, 2015, we didn't know how to do that. Okay, something else we tried in that paper, it was still in that paper, so there was an unsuccessful attempt. 
So the unsuccessful attempt went as follows. So we have greedy approval voting, that is algorithmically nice, but doesn't give us you know, the justified representation action. Right, and there's proportional approval voting that is not greedy, it's not sequential, but it actually gives us the action. Can we somehow mix the two? Right, or in other, in other words, can we have some sort of greedy sequential version of proportional approval voting, and maybe it would satisfy the PAV action? So in fact, we were not the first to come up with this idea. So remember that guy, Thiele, early 20th century, he actually wanted to use his role in practice. He, it wasn't just a theoretical exercise. He wanted to select parliaments. Right? And of course, early 20th century, we didn't have notions of NP completeness. Right? So the notion of NP completeness is roughly as old as I am, so less than 50 years old. <laughs> right? So early 20th century didn't exist. Right? But he had this idea, notion of approximation algorithms, obviously didn't exist either. But you know, he wanted to solve the problem. So he came up with the idea of doing a sequential algorithm based on PAV scores. Right? So that's his proposal. So we start with an empty committee, and we add candidates one by one so as to maximize the increase in PAV score at each iteration. Right. So that was actually used in practice in Sweden to actually select the Swedish parliament, I think, for a couple of years. Right. And this is tractable kind of by construction. Right. So at each point, you look at all kind of candidates who are not selected yet, try adding them to committee, to the committee, compute the new PAV score, right, and see which candidate fares the best. Right, so this is efficient. It's kind of PAV based, right? So maybe you could expect it to satisfy each year. Well, turns out then says no. Not just each year. Interestingly, it even fails the basic justified representation action. Right, which is kind of funny. Greedy, which is sequential, satisfies JR. PAV, which is kind of based, uses the same score, satisfies JR. This thing, the mixture of the two, fails to do so. Right, so this, okay. So Thiele's idea doesn't seem to quite work. Okay, so then we had one more idea, right? And this is something that probably, you know, puzzles some of you. When I described PAV, so I made this argument that, you know, first candidate you have in the committee is very useful, second candidate is less useful, right? And then I said one half, right? And for the third guy, I said one third, right? And, you know, that took some leap of faith, right? So why, why one half, why one third? I almost explained someone to raise their hand and complain, like, why? Right, and it's a very legitimate question to ask why, right? And in fact, okay, so... That's an illustration of why sequential PAV is different from PAV. So here, sequential PAV would optimally select C2 and C3 and happily cover everyone, whereas stupid, greedy sequential PAV would go for candidate one because it covers more voters, and then it will be stuck with choosing C2 or C3, but it, fail, it will fail to cover everyone. So greedy is not always good. Okay, so back to the idea of kind of our weights not being fully justified, right? So yeah, you can make this argument like why these weights? So let's try some different weights. Right? And then the hope would be maybe this kind of sequential approach failed with PAV weights, but if we try some other weights, maybe we can actually recover JR and ideally EJR, right? And if you do it sequentially, it's going to be polynomial time. Okay, so let's try to use arbitrary weight vector. So I think to preserve the intuition, I want it to be non-increasing, right? So my, and I'm going to normalize it. I'll make the first weight one, right? And the weights will go downwards from there, right? And I can do that both for the optimization version and for the sequential version. Right, so I'm going to call it weight vector AV and weight vector sequential AV. Okay, so what are interesting special cases? Right, so, so we've seen the one with kind of geometric, with the harmonic series. I, two natural, one, natural, other, one other natural special case to look at would be one zero zero zero. If I do one zero 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 in the optimization version, this means that each voter cares about being represented once, doesn't care about being represented more than once, Right, so my task is now maximum coverage. I want to cover as many voters as possible. Right, so this is what it boils down to. Right, and if I do the sequential version of that, right, so this is a voting rule we have already seen. What is it? Right, so that's greedy. Right, so at each point, I try to greedily add as many voters as possible to the set of covered voters. Right, so this is our good old trend, greedy approval voting. Right, and, in, and that should probably give us hope, right? Because we know that greedy approval voting actually satisfies JR, so it seems like we are on the right path. Well, that was the hope, it didn't quite work out. Okay, so greedy, also known under its new fancy name, 1000 sequential approval voting, satisfies JR. Turns out, if you try to tweak it even slightly, right, if you try to make second weight positive, right, so the first weight has to be one, right, so to tweak it, you have to make some of these weights positive, right, so the smallest change you can make is to make the second weight epsilon, other weights stay zero, right, 
If you do anything of this sort, you're going to break jail. Right? So jail in this framework is super fragile. Right? So if you have a sequential rule, so the only sequential rule that satisfies JR is the greedy approval voting rule, nothing else. Right? And of course, it fails extended justified representation because we already argued it does. Right? So what about the optimization version? Right? So just out of curiosity to complete the picture. Turns out that we use the harmonic weight sequence for a reason. If you try to use any other weight sequence, you are not going to get JR. You will get JR for some weights, right? And we can actually characterize what weights. Right, and it sort of falls out of this local slope argument. Right, but if you want full EJR, you are limited to using specifically harmonic weights and nothing else. Right, so at least we got something out of this exercise. Right, so we got a characterization of PAV in this class of weighted approval voting rules. Right, and it's characterized by satisfying EJR action. Right, so it's kind of nice, but it's not very useful if we try to find the voting rule that is plain all time computable and satisfies EJR. So remember, the first, now, okay, back to the history of the problem. Remember I told you the, for me, this quest started with a paper presented by Toby Walsh, as this Walsh paper at MPREF 2014. Now, two years later, there was another MPREF workshop, which I think I didn't attend in person, but I looked at the proceedings, and there was a paper with intriguing title, Proportional Justified Representation. Right? And that was written by a group in Madrid, led by Luis Sanchez Fernandez, and it proposed a tweak of the extended justified representation action. Okay, so to remind you, this is the definition of extended justified representation axiom, right? And what they did is they said, okay, so this condition that at least one vote in the group receives L representatives, it's kind of awkward and unnatural, and they also had a better argument against that condition, which I think in the interest of time I'm not going to reproduce. But anyway, they proposed to replace it with a different condition. Together, voters in X receive L representatives, meaning the intersection between the committee and union of these voters' ballots should be at least L. Right, so this is a weak axiom, right? And so they thought, okay, so maybe if we can't satisfy each other in polynomial time, maybe there's more hope for PGR. Right, so that was in the MPF paper. They didn't actually propose an explicit voting rule polynomial, that is polynomial time computable and satisfies the, this axiom in that paper, right? And this is where kind of my research group came in. We looked at that paper, right? So that was, it was me, Peter Skovron, and Martin Luckner, and we identified a fairly well-known voting rule that is polynomial time computable and satisfies PGR, but we had a technical condition. The size of the committee K had to divide the number of voters in. Right? But anyway, we wrote it up, we sent it to Luis Sanchez Fernandez, right? and they were happy to merge, and we ended up submitting the paper to AAAI, right? and this is the merged paper, so by the Spanish group and the group at that point in Oxford. Right? It got published to AAAI. Right? Okay, so that caveat was, of course, annoying, right? and interestingly, at that same time, there was, a, okay, there was another effort that proposed another voting rule that satisfied PGR. Okay, so that voting rule, okay, shout out to Marcus over there who provided that convenient picture. So that voting rule was also proposed, this time not by Danish but a Swedish researcher who lived roughly at the same time as Thiele. Right, so these ideas are kind of old ideas. Right, so Lars Edward Fragmen. Fragmen's idea was as follows. Under his, so he proposed the following setup. Each voter starts with zero amount of money and continuously earns money. Right? And then at some point, voters who, each candidate starts out with a price. Right? And these prices are uniform for all candidates. So at some point, a group of voters who jointly approve a candidate have enough money in their budget to buy that candidate. Then you let them buy that candidate, so they, that candidate is added to the committee, the money is deducted from the allowances, right? and the process continues until we select K candidates. Right, and this is by construction polynomial time. Right, so it's formulated as a continuous rule, but it's fairly easy to see where the you know, interesting events happen. Right, so this is effectively polynomial time rule. And what that group showed is that it satisfies PGR, but not EGR. So the authors of this paper are Marcus Brill, so I think Rupert Freeman, uh, two more authors who are probably not in this audience. Marcus, who else? Svante Svante Janssen? Swante Janssen, Martin Luckman. Okay, good. Right, so that was kind of concurrent. Right, and then at that point it seemed like, okay, so maybe EJR is too much to ask for. Maybe we can have PGR and we should be happy with PGR because really it wasn't obvious that there's a good argument for EJR against PGR. Right, I think now we have these arguments, but again, let me not go there in the interest of time. Okay, but one year later, so we had another idea. And that idea came from going back to that local swap argument and just you know, looking at it more carefully once again. 
So remember, how did we show that the committee that, <coughs> that, the committee that maximizes PAV score provides EGR? We showed it by means of a local swap, right? And that basically means the following. If you look at the committee and you can find a local swap that improves the PAV score, right, then this means that, of course, kind of your, okay. If you look at the committee and you can't find the swap that improves the PAV score, then by that same argument, your committee has to provide EGR. Right, because the argument was exactly that if the EGR is failed, there is an improving local swap. So contrapositive, if there is no improving local swap, then EGR is satisfied. Right, and that suggests a very natural local search algorithm. That's exactly what you do. You look at your, you start with an arbitrary committee. You look at your committee and you ask yourself, okay, is there a local swap that can improve this committee? Right? If there is a local swap that improves the PEV score, you perform it. Right, and once there is no local swap that improves the committee, you stop, and your result satisfies EGR. Thus, okay, so this voting rule at least has the advantage that you can compute each iteration efficiently. Right? It's not yet quite a polynomial time algorithm. Why? Because it's not clear how many iterations that will take. Right? And this is something that we observed back then in 2018. We left it as an open question if this voting rule, local search PAV formulated in, the, in this fashion is actually polynomial time computable in the sense of having polynomial number of iterations. So very recently, my student Sonia Kreitsch refuted that, kind of confirmed that conjecture showing that this vanilla local search PAV may actually take super polynomial number of iterations, right? But we are not done yet. We are not done yet. We still need to look at the local swap argument yet more carefully. And if we do that, we observe the following. If a committee fails EGR, we can find a committee with a better PAV score. I already told you that. What you, what you get by looking at the proof even more carefully is that the improvement is actually significant. If your, voting, if your committee fails EGR, there's a much better, there's a committee with a much better PAV score. Much better in this case means by at least n over k squared, where any of the number of voters k is the committee size. Right? And that means that instead of doing local, local search, looking for, you know, vanishingly small swaps, it's enough to look at large swaps. Right? So we call it epsilon local search PV. We start with some committee, and if there is a local swap that improves the PV score by at least epsilon, we perform it. Right? And this argument says that as long as you keep your epsilon less than equal n over k squared, right, you are going to ensure EGR. Right? And on the other hand, if you keep your epsilon at least that quantity, Right, well, the maximum PV score can be bounded as something like n times k log k, right, because the maximum voter satisfaction and the harmonic utilities from k candidates is k log k, right, you've got n voters, right, so you start with a, you know, the minimum PV score is zero, the maximum PV score is something polynomial in n over k, you improve it by something n over related to, by something polynomial in n and k at each iteration, you can only make polynomial in many steps. Right, so this gives us a, voting rule that satisfies EJR and is in P. Right? And at that point, we were very happy because that resolved our original research question. Right? So to have a voting rule that satisfies EJR and is polynomial time computable. So are we done? Well, what do you want to use epsilon local search PV in real life? Right? Is this something that you think you can realistically send, sell to voters in your community? Right? And I don't even mean necessarily parliamentary elections or local council election. But you know, even to select your university assembly, is this something you are willing to explain to your colleagues from the humanities department? Uh, I, I think not. Right? So there was another, kind of one year later, there was another voting rule. It was proposed by Piotr Skovern and Dominic Peters. Right? It was initially they called it rule X, and later they, rena they renamed it very sensibly into method of equal shares breaking with the tradition of having atrociously bad names for concepts in this research area. Okay, so yeah, extended justified representation, proportional justified representation, how do you even remember which one is which? Okay, so this is a good name, method of equal shares. So abbreviation maybe not so good, but the name is O. Okay, so under this rule, we can think of this rule as a nicer, simpler version of fragment, right? Which is both simple and actually does more. Under this rule, the voters don't earn money continuously. They just start with the budget, and they use that budget to buy candidates, and they buy them in an equal contribution fashion. So whenever a candidate is bought, every voter has to contribute equally to that candidate, with some caveats, but that's roughly the idea. Right? And that voting rule satisfies EJR and is, in fact, polynomial time computable. Right? And on top of that, it's actually an appealing voting rule. Okay, so I'm saying this, I think maybe in a year you're going to see a paper from me that actually tries to disagree with this last bullet point, 
right? But it's certainly more appealing than lo epsilon local search PED, right? So for sure. Okay, so why is this good news? Well, multi-venom voting rule is nice. So I told you stories how you can use multi venom approval voting rule. But here's an even more exciting and even more practical setup, right? And that's participatory budgeting. In participatory budgeting, you have a bunch of projects to be implemented, say, in your local area. So like, for instance, building a playground, building some cycle path, improving the roads, kind of creating a new park. Right? And these projects come with a cost, and there's a budget. Right? And the goal is now voters report preference over projects. And you can think of those as approval preferences. I care about the cycling path, right? And maybe I don't care so much about road repair. I like the park. I don't care about the playground. Right, so voters report these preferences, right, and the goal is to select a budget feasible set of projects to fund based on voters' preferences. Right, I think this is known in this community as combinatorial public project setting, right, and the focus of this community, I think, was on strategy proofness. Right, but you can also think of it under the lens of proportionality. Right, so what is fair and proportional, right, and you don't, then you don't care so much about strategy proofness. And something to notice is that this setting actually extends multi winner voting rules, right, simply because multi winner voting is, is participatory budgeting with unit costs. Right, so that's exactly that. So this is a strict generalization. <coughs> Right, and proportional uh, participatory budgeting is something that actually happens around the world. Not so much in this country, unfortunately, even though me and one of our local organizers, Maria Polokarov, just had an EPSERC project funded where we've got some buy-in from the local council here to implement something like that, maybe eventually, right, if they can be convinced by what we do. Okay, so the commitment is not very firm, but yeah, get back to us in a few years and maybe something will happen. Right, but the other more civilized countries around the world that actually implement participatory budgeting, right, so Brazil, for instance, right, so United States, France, Spain, right, and they, of course, not the entire budget, but a significant chunk of the budget is actually allocated using participatory budgeting. And let me also give a shout out to, to Ashish Goel, who brought the attention of our community to this problem. I think Ashish was the first to look at the problem from the computer science perspective. I think I might be wrong here, but I think his first paper on that kind of predates this line of work, goes to 2014. He wasn't so much focused on proportionality in his work, more on preference solicitation and various practical aspects, but I think he should get credit for, you know, focusing the community attention on this problem. Okay, so how is it relevant? Well, uh, so the way participatory budgeting was done around the world, till very recently, is by greedy methods, right? So selecting projects one by one based on the approval scores and costs in some fashion. But very recently, so building, so, okay, so the good thing about the method of equal share that I mentioned is that it actually adapts naturally to the setting of participatory budgeting. Right, so that's not quite the case for the fragment rule. That's not quite the case for the local search PV rule. I mean, they adapt, but they lose their appealing properties. Method of equal shares, on the other hand, extends nicely and smoothly and satisfies extended justified representation axiom for that setting. Right? Uh, for extended justified representation, kind of adapted appropriately for approval ballots and also in a slightly relaxed version of the axiom for more general ballots. And recently, Dominic, Piotr, and co-authors have been able to convince a couple of local authorities, one in the Polish town of Vilichka, another, another in, Swedish, in a Swiss, Swiss town of Aro, to actually use method of equal shares to allocate parts of funds, parts of their funds. Right, so this is a poster from Poland, Zelonem Leon. So for those of you who speak a Slavic language like I do, you could probably guess that this is related to kind of green projects, like environmentally conscious projects. And you should probably talk to Dominic about it. I didn't want to steal his slides, but I think there is evidence that the distribution of projects is in many ways more equitable than it would have been under you know, traditional voting group. Right, so this is a win for the community. Okay, so that would be perhaps a good place to finish this talk, but Jason just showed me the slide saying I have 15 more minutes. Right, so let me talk about a few more things. <laughs> okay, so one application I showed you is, one application I mentioned was participatory budgeting. Participatory budgeting in the context of actually allocating local council funding. Right, but I also earlier I mentioned blockchain, right, and blockchain is also a natural application area of this line of work. Right, and something that is important in the context of blockchain is verifiability, right? Okay, so commuting for, you know, for theoretical computer scientists, most theoretical computer scientists, to be fair, right? So we tend to equate fast with polynomial time, right? And that's probably true for many settings, 
right? But for some practical scenarios, polynomial time isn't necessarily good enough, right? So what would be good enough is linear time or nearly linear time, right? And this is something that blockchain people really want for their validator elections, right? Because this happens frequently, right? And you have to respond in a time-sensitive manner. Right, so now method of equal shares, fragment, PAV even, right, so those are fairly fast, but somehow not fast enough for their purposes. Right, so one idea they had is perhaps we could outsource the computation. Right, so we can outsource the computation, so ask some potentially untrusted party to select, to elect this committee for us, right, off-chain, and then on-chain we would just verify that this committee actually satisfies the desired axioms, and we'll go with that. Right, and we, the hope would be that verification is easier than computation. Right, so unfortunately, these axioms, PGR and EGR, don't behave in this manner. Right, so what was proved right, in our papers, in fact, right, is that both of these axioms are actually NP hard to verify. Right, so this is this annoying case that finding a good committee is polynomial time, but verifying if a committee is good is NP hard. Right, what, what can be done, nevertheless, is to provide, okay, so, so here is an idea, though. Okay, local search, I think, made a few appearances in this talk, right? Local search and local swap arguments, right? So you can actually think of these as a verification procedure, right? If you think about local search PV, well, if you can check in a linear time, if a committee is in the output of epsilon local search PV or local search PV, right? All you need to do is look at the possible swaps and evaluate them, right? And if you analyze the running time carefully, it's actually linear in the input size. Right, so epsilon local search PV is actually a useful voting rule from that perspective. Right, but again, I argued, okay, so this is good news, right, and this is simple observation. Right? But uh, I mentioned that local search PV is not a great um, algorithm in the setting of participatory budgeting. Right, so if you want this sort of verifiability in participatory budgeting, you want to have some sort of, you know, maybe local swap argument or local search argument anyway that applies to the method of equal shares, right? Right, so then the question would be, can we turn, well, perhaps fragment and ideally method of equal shares into locally verifiable rule, right? And for fragment, this was done by Savalas and Stewart, right? And they produced a voting rule that is a mixture of fragment and another voting rule with similar properties, maximin, maximin rule, which produces verifiable PGR, right? And I mean, PGR is nice, we want EJR. PGR is nice, but we do want something strong. We want EJR, right? And in a recent paper with my student, Sonia, we proposed a verifiable approach, kind of, we produced an adaptation of method equal shares that actually gives you EJR in polynomial manner, and it also works for participatory budgeting. And again, this builds on a, some predecessor work by Dominic Peters, Piotr Skovron, Nisarkshak, and Grzegorz Piotrzynski, who is a student of Piotr, right, and there they came up with an idea of priceability, right, as a method of verifying voting rules, right, and we kind of build on these ideas, right, but what we show is that method of equal shares can be turned into a linear time verifiable rule, right, and this is under submission at the moment, right, and the idea is, again, our star of the day, local search, we found a way to, to convert method of equal shares to a local search rule. Okay, so there's more, there's more work on, I mean, this paper, so the first paper was from 2015, right, so it's been eight years, right, and fortunately it wasn't just, you know, me and my group or my former students working on it, right, so this actually gained some traction, in fact, some of, some of it, I think, independently from our work. So let me just give you a brief survey of what else has been done in this area. Okay, so... There were a couple of attempts to propose strong axioms. One of them is full justified representation. Another one to be presented in this EC by Yannick Peters, unrelated Dominic Peters, well, entirely different person, right? So, so there's a paper, Brill Peters, in this workshop that proposes EJR plus axiom that is in many ways a more appealing version of EJR, right, which is also e naturally easy to verify, okay? So if you like this talk, so do make sure you show up for Yannick's talk. So there's a notion of the core, and again, those of you who are familiar with the notion of the core, kind of generally, might have wondered if my EJR axiom is core in disguise. Well, it turns out no, so each axiom is weaker than the core, right, in a fairly subtle technical way, but the interesting, so the interesting fact about the core, kind of, so you can define the notion of the core for this setting, right, and it's perhaps the biggest open problem in this field is whether the core is always non-empty for multi-venner voting. For participatory budgeting, there are known counterexamples, 
Right, and then the question could be if you can do some sort of approximate version of the core, and there's been quite a bit of work on that by Kamesh Munagala and some of his students. Currently, Wang, who I think was a runner-up for the Best Dissertation Award, kind of announced yesterday, I think he's, he worked quite a bit on that. Right, so other questions you can ask you, kind of these axioms are kind of very black and white yes or no axioms. You can try to define quantitative measures of proportionality. So there's something called degree of proportionality proposed by Piotr Skovron and his co-authors. Right, so that's another interesting topic. So there's been a work on applying these ideas in the context of rankings. Right, so I have, I have work on that. So again, with the you know, familiar characters, S is Skovron, L is Lochner, B is Brill, P is Peters. So that's Dominic Peters. Right? And I think there's been some follow-up work on that as well. So one can, one can discuss justified representation in multi-round setting where you run elections run by round, selecting one alternative at each round. And there's been some recent and ongoing work on that, including my book with another student, Nicholas De. Right? And then, I mean, you can ask, you know, the usual array of questions. So there's a bunch of hard problems. Do they become easier for restricted domains? Right? And there are several restricted domains that have been looked at. Right, so what if you try to do all this, but with some additional distribution constraints? And there was a paper in this EC, I think yesterday or day before yesterday, that discussed that. You can ask about price of JR, kind of how much social, utilitarian social welfare do you lose if you impose JR axioms? So I've done some work on that as well, and other people have as well. Right, so generally, this somehow became a large research here in its own right, which isn't quite something we expected when, you know, when we wrote that email to Harris in the summer 2014. Okay, so let me stop here and just give a short shout out to my co-authors on this work. Okay, so caveat here, right? So this isn't the intersection of the list of my co-authors and people who worked on multi venner voting. This is the list of people who worked with me on multi venner voting. So Dominic is not on the list because all of his work on multi venner voting and participatory budgeting is not co-authored with me, right? So same for Nisarg. Right there. But these are people who worked with me on this topic, right? And there are many more people, I think, in this audience who also have thought about similar problems. Okay, so let me stop here. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, great. Are there questions? Whatever. Actually, I want to pass the mic back so we don't have to. Um, from a strategic perspective for voters, um, I'm sort of interested in like how exploitable are, are these rules? Um, you know, are, are there interesting uh, strategic considerations? Oh, there's a person sitting to your right who can answer these questions much better than I can. Dominic, do you want to take this one? <laughs> okay, so you can prove an impossibility result that anything that satisfies JR must be manipulable by voters pretending not to like popular candidates so they retain their voting power. Uh, I haven't seen much more than that you know, in a more quantitative way. Maybe there's more to be said. Right. Okay, so the short answer is it's hopeless. <laughs> hey, thank you for this really cool talk. Um, I, my question might be a bit naive, but um, for these sets uh, of committees satisfying JR or EJR or the other axioms that you listed, are there <coughs> characterizations of when they're non-empty and how rich they are? And do the different methods typically, in practice, select similar solutions? Uh, very nice question. So I have a little empirical paper on that with a master's student. So some of these rules are similar, others are very different. So if you, okay, so I, there's very little there in the way of theoretical characterizations, but empirically, so you can look at fragment and method of equal shares on one hand, and they're fairly similar. So they typically don't produce the same committee, but say if you select a committee of size 10 out of 100 candidates, the overlap would be like on the order of seven or eight at least, often more, right? And on the other hand, if you look at local search PAV, especially Epson local search PAV, right? So that just tends to be very indecisive rule. So it produces lots of committees, right? And many of them would be very different from fragment and method of equal shares committees, right? But I agree that getting a better, you know, theoretical grasp of how similar these are kind of would be an interesting question. Right, so far, all we have is empirics. Uh, what happens if you have uh, constraints on the committees? Like you say, I don't want to hire more than five people in uh, machine learning and not more than two people who do security. Or, 
stuff like this. What? <laughs> the, right. It will be rejected out of hand, obviously. All of them should be deep learning. Right, but, so know. the complaint was, so for the online audience, right, that there can't be an upper bound on machine learning, only a lower bound. Okay, so more seriously, okay, so constraints tend to break axioms. So I have a paper that in last year's Amos with uh, Hu Yuzhou and Min Ming Li, right, and other people, other people I think independently had a bunch of papers on that, right? So. Basically, if you, if you have constraints, all you're left with is trying to approximate the axioms, and you can try to approximate them better or worse. So I think the paper we saw in EC kind of earlier this week kind of attempts to do something about it. Right? But I don't think you can get like clean results if you want constraints and fairness axioms. Right? So you're left with approximations, you're left with special cases. Uh, yeah, about PAV, you know, it's kind of sad that only the harmonic series was the one that worked and because it's maybe a little bit arbitrary. Like, I like my, to have a second candidate half as much as the first. Is, is there a version of this with cardinal utilities, you know, sort of true utilities of these people and, and um, try to figure out a proportional voting rule with cardinal utilities? Uh, not. Not that I know of. So you may notice that PAV is in many ways kind of the harmonic sequence really looks very much like Nash social welfare. Right? It's not quite that, but it has similar flavor. So I imagine if you actually had numerical utilities, you would have to go for Nash social welfare. Right? So what sort of axiomatic properties you get for that, I'm not quite sure. Right? So there might be work on that, but I'm not aware of it. Sorry. So Vince? I was Comment. just saying the, the core also would make sense in this context. But. Right, yeah, so this has been, okay, so general, general utilities have been considered, I think, especially in the context of participatory budgeting, right, but then things get trickier, right, so I think, so for, for instance, for general utilities, proportional budget in participatory budgeting, you no longer get EJR, you get EJR up to one committee member, right, so things become hairier. Actually, let me ask a question related to that last comment you made. Uh, it seems like EJR uh, is, uh, could be compatible with approximation. So you could ask for, can I get it easily with like L over two uh, yeah. rather than L? Uh, and I wonder if that's been something that uh, right. has been So the notion of proportionality degree that I mentioned, right, so I think basically tries to do something of that sort. Right, and then in the context of, I think, the core primarily, less EJI and more core, right, so this is the line of work by Kamesh Munagala and his group, right, so they, were, they really, because, you know, EJI is always achievable, core, maybe it's not, at least we don't know, and therefore there's more justification in focusing on approximation algorithm, right, so this has been done for the core. So less for EJI, but kind of personality degree is kind of a quantitative notion that tries to do that, right, so strengthening EJI, I suppose, rather than relaxing it. All right, let's uh, thank Edith again. Thank you.